Hello, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Mike Tellerino. We're here with uh, with Alex, our co-host, and Jim Overweiss. He's the senator from the 25th di uh, district. Um, Jim, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I've uh, grown up in the uh, Aurora area, uh, lived there my whole life, as uh, has my family, my father, grandfather, great-grandfather. Uh, and my uh, grandfather actually uh, had cows, a little too much extra milk, and decided to start selling it to neighbors. Is that how you got in the Overweiss uh, dairy? Well, he, uh, in 1927, he bought a processing plant in Aurora and uh, began uh, you know, an official uh, business, putting milk in bottles and delivering it to homes. Um, in uh, uh, 1951, my father was running the business and opened a new, uh, bigger plant and began making ice cream because he had a little cream left over because more people were starting to drink 2% and fat-free milk. All right. Uh, and he had too much cream left, so he made a very, very rich <laughs> ice cream as a way to get rid of some of the cream. Uh, that tradition has kind of gone on. We now have, I think, the the richest ice cream in the world, to the best it's of our knowledge. It's unbelievable. So anyway, I grew up in that business, uh, you know, making ice cream cones. Uh, uh, we put milk in glass bottles. I knocked on doors, delivered milk, did everything. But I had a brother, uh, John, eight years older than I, who went into the business, and I decided that I really don't want to be little brother Jim for the rest of my life. So I actually uh, started a, a money management firm, a family of mutual funds, right. and really spent most of my uh, career in that area. Uh, but about 25 years ago, my brother had a stroke and was unable to continue, and I ended up buying the dairy business at that time, so mm -hmm. I ended up with two businesses. Fortunately, I have uh, two kids who are running those two businesses today so that I have time to uh, uh, spend trying to uh, save our state and or our federal government, and that's been a, a frustrating experience. What, uh, what motivated you to get into politics? You're a very successful businessman. You've got a, a great family, and you've got a, everything going for yourself. Why would you go forward with all the pressure that comes with running for a uh, state office. Now you're running for Congress. Well, my wife thinks it would be a much better decision to uh, spend the winter in Florida, play golf, <laughs> yeah. tennis, and what have you. Uh, I uh, honestly, uh, uh, look, something's got to be done in my opinion. Uh, Illinois is an absolute disaster. And uh, our, our federal government, I'm, I'm concerned, is not too far behind. We're, we're, we're at something like $22 trillion in debt. Uh, we must begin to uh, limit our, our spending to our uh, level of revenues, and uh, the lower the taxation rates, the uh, better economic growth we're likely to, to uh, uh, create, and that can help everybody all the way uh, uh, down the line. Uh, as we're seeing right now, we're seeing the growth uh, at reasonably good levels, and, and after a slow start, wages are now starting to pick up at a at a reasonable rate, again, supply and demand, and, and uh, we have a, a great demand for labor, so that tends to, to bring the price up. So uh, that's really the reason that I decided to uh, run for office. Um, if I don't do it, who's going to do it? I'm, right. I'm in a position where I've got the, the experience, the background, I understand uh, 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 the economics. And I will tell you, one of the things I've learned, I've been in the Illinois Senate for seven years, one of the things that I've learned very clearly is there is a big difference between those senators, whether they're Republican or Democrat, who have spent some time in the private sector, understand what it's like to try to balance a budget, to prioritize spending, and, and so on, versus the other side who are career politicians. They've never, never worked in the private sector. Never owned the business or... Right. They're still good people, um, and, and they believe they're there to try to create more programs to help their constituents. Uh, you know, and, and that's great, that's a, a noble calling. The problem is they don't seem to be willing to make the hard choices uh, about um, uh, prioritizing what they, they can't do everything. They want to do everything, right. but, but they don't have the background to understand they can't do everything without creating severe financial stress for our state somewhere in the future. What? And we're getting close to that point, by the way. And if elected to Congress, what would be one of your first priorities. If you were to get elected tomorrow and you took that seat, what would you, what would be your first mandate? Well, when people have asked that question, I've said there are really three things that uh, probably have my strongest focus. Uh, the one is we've just been talking about, that's the uh, economic side, what we can do to, to make sure that 
this country provides opportunities for people who are willing to take the risk or willing to work. Uh, you know, and veterans certainly are, are a, a group who have a great deal of experience and discipline, and it's a great opportunity if they can have a, a choice to start a business and build that business. I want to create the right environment for them to be able to do so. Uh, the second issue that uh, uh, <coughs> that I think is is really important that that we need to to focus our attention on also is to solve this illegal immigration problem, and and that's something yeah. that's been kicking around for 20 years. It's something I've had a focus on for 15. Um, our president today is taking it seriously and trying to do some things. I, I don't think building a wall solves all the problem, by the way. I think it takes a lot more than that. Uh, Alex, you're laughing. Yeah, well, actually, uh, one of my fields of practice is actually immigration law. and That's I mean, a hot topic today. It, it, it is a very hot right? topic, it to is. say the least, right. But, you know, th there's, a, there's a distinction between letting people in and, you know, just putting a blanket wall up that, you know, I mean, there's other ways around it. You know, people people can come in through Canada, they can swim. It's not right. it's not a That's be all not, end all. Uh, you know, the, the, solu right. Right. the solution is prob is probably, you know, stricter stricter control, stricter stricter admissions policies. Um, you know, but but at the same time there are there are countermeasures too. You know, for example, a lot of the people that I represent tend to be from war torn countries seeking asylum, you know, and, yeah. and, and so yeah. You know, you have to measure the humanitarian factor versus you know just a, a hard line policy, which seems to be what our president has drawn. But but that's a little off topic. Jim, what's your policy? What's your practice on this? What's well, your take on this? the system has been so badly abused that we really need to, to look at it differently. I th this may sound strange for a businessman, but uh, unfortunately, I think there's been kind of an unholy alliance between. Democrats on the one side who see this as a, a source of lots of future votes if they can bring people in illegally, and on the other side, right. Republican businessmen who see this as a potential source of cheap labor. And that, that's been a sort of an unholy alliance that has really stopped So how do we progress. come together with this? I, I think we, we have to strictly enforce our, our laws against companies who hire people illegally. Uh, we have the E-Verify system, which allows any businessman or any company to uh, to very simply check to see whether the, the name that the employee has given matches their social security number. If it doesn't, then the employee has a chance to correct it, to straighten it out, to explain why there is a problem. Uh, but in most cases, it's probably because that's not really their social security number. So, so if, <laughs> if we do that, we can take away the economic incentives for people to break our laws. Right. And I, I'm willing to, to find some type of a compromise and what I've suggested is we should be willing, in the situations where uh, people have brought young kids into this country and they've grown up in this country for 10, 15, or 20 years and they've considered themselves a part of this country, we should find a way for those kids to become citizens of this country, a sure. direct uh, path to citizenship. Because in this country, we don't hold crimes or mistakes of parents against the kids. And this, this wasn't something that the young kids did, right. this was something the parents did. So, so they should have that opportunity. We also don't want to break up families, but we don't want to reward the parents who broke our laws. Come here to have that baby. Can, can, I, can I ask you something? What, you, what yeah. would you say to, to, to a situation where somebody, you know, let's say they're in their 20s and they flee a country and they, they came into this country legally and they, they were just looking for a job to send money back home to their family and they've been here for 20, 30 years working hard and just trying to support their family. What would you say to that to the family of that individual and would you want to send them back or what, what would you what would be your stance on something like that? Well, what you have to do is, is look at the whole picture from above. We as a country need to decide how many people we're willing to accept as new citizens each year. Now, it's been roughly a million a year for many years. And by the way, that's one of the most liberal of any of the developed world, uh, percentage-wise, compared to our population. Um, so if that's not the right number, then let's change the number. It should be a million and a half, make it a million and a half. It should be 750,000, make it 700. Whatever it is, well, let's have that number. And if, let's say a million, because that's what it's been. Then, as soon as you say it's okay for this 100,000 people to break our laws and come in, and we're going to accept them anyway, that means you penalize 100,000 over here who are following our laws and trying to do the right things. Right. It's the same thing I was talking about just a, a moment ago. It's I, unfair to the group who are following our laws, and that's not right. Exactly. And I can certainly appreciate that you're making. You know, you're making a an argument where the law should be applied equally to everyone. This, certainly, I've made that argument in the past, 
but you know, don't, don't you think this should be more of a, a case by case basis? Where you know, I'm not saying encourage people to come in now. I'm saying, I'm saying, you know, for the people who are already here. You know, well, unfortunately, that's the same argument that was made back in the 80s by Ronald Reagan, and I bought it 100% of the time. I said, yes, you're right. Well, let's give amnesty to all these people here, but then let's set the law to prevent this from happening in the future. Except it we doesn't didn't. change. It, it hasn't. Now, I will go along with you if we could, in fact, establish laws and policies that would prevent this from happening again in the future. I'd agree with you 100%. Okay. But I'm, I, I, I'm skeptical of our willingness to actually do that. To make change. I mean, certainly, certainly change is a difficult topic to broach and actually reach. Yeah. But, I, I mean, at the same time, you know, these are real people's lives that we're dealing with. These aren't just right. you know, arbitrary numbers. I mean, it, you know, numbers on a page, names on a piece of paper. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is someone's life. So. Are you familiar with a, a non-immigrant visa? Yes. Perhaps that offers some type of a solution in a case like this. Uh, which would allow them to stay here legally and work, but not give them a path to citizenship. I mean, certainly, you know. That's the kind of thing I would consider in a case like that. It's got to be an option. Yeah. It's, it's probably you know, the best one out there right now. In that, that situation. I, also, right. by the way, uh, I, I think if we're going to say, okay, we're going to allow all these people who are, who are kids who've grown up here to, to now become citizens, there should be an offset against that. To me, the logical offset is to end the so-called birthright citizenship where somebody can come into this country illegally eight months pregnant or nine months pregnant have the baby the baby becomes it's a citizen automatically a citizen automatically that's and then uh, say yeah. now that the, now that the baby's a citizen the parents ought to be allowed to to exactly. stay as well that gives uh, them a path right to the right i i think our, our policy should be if you are born in the united states to an american citizen, citizen. you're automatically a citizen exactly if you're born in the united states to somebody who's here illegally you shouldn't have an automatic system. Jim, what do you what do you think about sanctuary states? What, where do you stand on that? Oh, I, I think that's terrible. I think it's horrendous. I think it's a, it's an, a, it's abusive, and it's it's really saying we don't like that law, so we're going to ignore it. How do they get How do they get away with that? I, I you know, if, if they're detaining someone who has violated the law, they have him locked up. Uh, he's got convictions, felony convictions, and he's been deported two or three times and he's due to be released and ICE tells him we're coming for him and then they release him knowing that ICE is going to come and get him at a certain date and they release him ahead of time. If, if I were in, in the position of power to enforce that, I would take action against the people who are doing that. I think that's clearly a violation of law, clearly illegal, shouldn't be allowed How to happen. How are the states getting away with that? <laughs> are they not... Maybe you can answer that better than I, I can. I honestly can't answer that, but actually, I did want to ask you one question. I want to go back to what what you said about the about the the anchor babies. Sure. Okay. Um, so, you know, it is actually um, an anchor baby cannot actually file uh, for for their parents until I think they're either eighteen or twenty one years of age. So, you know, when you're saying they're using all of these these they're coming here, they're having these kids, and then staying here using these kids. Can you can you just elaborate what you mean by that a little bit? Because you know they're not. I mean, they're not waiting 20 years for that kid to grow up and then file a petition for him. So can you just explain? Well, they may or may not do. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Right. You know the answer to that better than I do. But clearly, uh, when you have a situation here where the baby is now a citizen, it's much more difficult for people to, uh, for ICE or whoever it is, to say, okay, but the parents are not, so we're sending them back. But I, but I mean I actually represent people who are in the immigration court system, and you know, and a lot of them have, you know, young children who who are born here, but they're still they're still being placed into deportation proceedings. I mean, I, I'm. And saying, what being, happens to I, the I child? Mean, that's I, what I, happens I, to the child. The child ends up having to go back with the parents. I, I mean, is it, that fair? It, it's. I mean, it, honest, honestly, it's an unequal or an unequal application of the law. But you know, at, at the same at the same time, yes, this baby is most likely one of these anchor babies that you're referring to. Right. So you know, did the you know was this U.S. citizenship acquired in the best way? Probably not. But you know, to answer your question, I think it is fair to say, look, you came over the border just to have this baby, and the baby sorry. is an American citizenship. But sorry, that sorry. It doesn't it, work that it, way. It doesn't because it's just giving you the right to come here and. Have your son or daughter a uh, automatic citizen? I mean, it just. But I will disagree. I don't. Th I think in most of those cases, what's actually happening is people look away and let them stay. Well, 
you know, in terms of who is being prosecuted, I can't answer that. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you that in terms of who is, in terms of the cases that I've dealt, because most people who aren't being prosecuted don't come to see me, you know, as an attorney. So, right, it, right. you know, the people who are being prosecuted, I see this all the sure, time. Sure, sure. You know, yes. So, but, uh, but I can't speak to, you know, who they choose to prosecute. Right. Yep. It's just amazing, you know, uh, these sanctuary states that they can get away with what they get away with. It, it's uh, it, before I get off track, you'd ask me, and I said there are three things. The third thing that right. that, that I'm I sorry. want You're to right. focus on is is also trying to solve our uh, medical care system. Uh, we have a, a real mess right. from veterans on down. Uh, uh, I believe that if if we want to control our our uh, medical care system in the future, we need to have more transparency of, of prices right. and we need to have more competition. For many years, I proposed uh, we ought to allow the reimportation of American-made drugs from Canada uh, because right now our drug companies are selling our American-made drugs to Canadian pharmacies at a Canadian government essentially at much lower rates than they're sold in the United States. So United States, United States citizens are the ones who are paying right for the cost of developing these drugs. And, you know, there's a profit incentive to do that. Uh, more than 50% of all new drugs discovered in, in the world are discovered here in the U.S. But those costs should be borne by citizens around the world who are using those drugs, not just by American citizens. So that's one thing, and I'm, I'm delighted that the president is taking on that, uh, uh, that challenge. Um, I also proposed legislation in Springfield uh, last year called the, the Right to Shop Act, which basically said that, um, if you're going to have elective surgery, like a hip or knee replacement or something of that nature, and if you choose, purely voluntarily, but if you choose to look around for price and you find somebody that you want to provide that service uh, at a lower cost than the average in-network price that your insurance company is providing, you can go out of network, have that service done, the insurance company will have to pay for it, and you get to keep half of the savings. Whoa. The insurance company gets to keep the other half. That sounds like a win-win, doesn't yeah. it? I, I certainly sign up for that. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm here's, on board. Here's the problem. To do that, uh, the insurance companies would be required to post their average in-network price on their website. Uh, transparency, competition, good things in my opinion, but the insurance companies don't like that because now their monopoly is being threatened a little bit. They right. lose some control of the situation. You're giving, putting some power into the hands of the consumers, which is the right thing to do. But the insurance company don't want to give up that, that power and that control. It's amazing. So, so, and, and by the way, I've had several Democrat sponsors on that bill with me, but so we can, still can't get it. Can I, can I ask you a question? How do, how do these you know, insurance companies and these drug companies that you were talking about with these eye-gouging prices to American citizens, how do they get away with this? Is there no cap on what they could set up price of a pill for? Uh, just buy only beware, what they can. Well, buy or they beware. can negotiate uh, with their major buyers. Namely, it, it, typically, it's uh, you know insurance companies. Um, you know, it's very. It, it, you're on a very difficult, touchy subject because, as sure. I mentioned earlier, more than fifty percent of all new drugs are discovered in the United States. Why in the United States? Because there are those opportunities to charge higher prices, which causes companies to want to spend the money, billions of dollars in research, and we have a very difficult um, uh, s governmental system to get approval of those drugs. But, but why are there those opportunities to charge those prices here? You know, I, I mean, honestly, if we, if we reduce those opportunities, however they may be coming about, wouldn't then the distribution of... Uh, you know, of new drugs be kind of rebalanced a little more around the world? There would be fewer yeah. new drugs. Right. People wouldn't spend the money to discover them if they can't make a big profit doing so. It's the whole patent system that, that provides those profits. It protects them for a period. Now, there's <coughs> certainly a good argument that, that maybe the, the patent protection is too long. It could be shortened by a couple of years or three years or four years um, and still give some patent protection. Uh, there are other approaches to it, but, you know, it, it's difficult to argue uh, when we have come up with so many life-saving drugs that, that have really benefited our not only our country, but the whole world. Oh. My point is, everybody ought to share in those costs, not just U.S. So, citizens. So, so, you're, so what you're saying basically is, is that because, because America provides the opportunity for such a profit, exactly. th these companies are incentivized to come here to and develop, with, uh, these, yes. uh, develop these drugs. Yes. Right. And to spend yeah. billions of, risk billions of dollars. Yeah. And, and sometimes these things don't work and they have to write off, you know, 
know, 500 million, a billion, whatever the case may be. So they, if they have to write off a billion here, they better make two billion over exactly. here. Exactly. Right. So, so, what, so what if, um, so we have all these insurance companies who, who supposedly are paying for these drugs, you know, now, but not everyone has insurance. Now, is there some kind of, you know, means or is there some kind of discussion in the works uh, about, you know, pe about having these drugs priced differently for people who are unable to access, you know, basic health care? Actually, um, many, I would probably even say most of the drug companies will provide for those right. who can't afford to pay it, they will provide exactly. uh, access to those drugs. They even advertise that on, on their commercials. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, they mm -hmm. do. And, uh, I'll take your question even one step further. What about, uh, let's say, the people in uh, Kenya uh, or Somalia or you know Ghana where they clearly can't afford that? Uh, how do we take care of that? How do we handle those? Uh, not an easy answer to that question. Should the drug companies make large quantities available to uh, people in those countries where people can't really afford to, I, I, I don't have a good answer for you. I mean, the, you know, you're, you have to balance business and, you know, humanitarian questions here. I mean, it's, it's a difficult answer, but, you, you know, what, what can be done? I mean, are, are there discussions being had? I mean, you're the one on the, you know, Senate. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're asking you. <laughs> well, in the Illinois Senate, we really don't have much to do. That okay. this is, but if I'm elected to Congress, that's what I'm saying. This is one of the three issues I really uh, want to tackle fervently. Jim, I, I read something in a press release that you put out today. At the, they're putting together uh, where immigrants are being put before our military veterans. Tell us about. It. Sure. Uh, one of the things I think that that can help move our our healthcare delivery forward is to have an electronic system where all of your uh, records are here in one place. Uh, we're, we're doing that, we're moving towards that in the private sector. Uh, that My opponent in this congressional race has proposed providing that system for illegal immigrants quickly uh, right now, spending the money on it now instead of spending it on veterans. There, there is a proposal to do it for veterans but they're talking about this taking many years to actually happen. And yet, uh, my opponent wants to do it right now, spend the money first on the illegal immigrants. To me, that's, that's obnoxious. How do we allow that to even be a consideration? To put them before our veterans. I mean, so, so she, well, wouldn't, what she the, wouldn't express as put it before our veterans. She'd express, just do this now. We're not well, talking about the, the fact difference. that what is, what, is the the difference. what is the response to you know to saying that well we don't have this for veterans why don't we handle this for the veterans first and then potentially deal with the illegal immigrants later that's exactly the nature of the press release we put out today we'll see if the newspapers will pick up uh, pick it up and run with it or if it'll be ignored oh, I, I hope it's picked up because to me our veterans need better health care they really do. Yes, they're, the health care that they're receiving at the VA um, it just is inadequate. It some really is. some of the politicians are talking about the so-called Medicare for all. Right. Uh, I am opposed to that. I think we need to allow people to have choices to to keep the, to really keep their doctor if they want to keep their doctor for real. Uh, for real, right? Yeah, that, and, that's the key word. For and, real and competition among various medical plans to allow that. Right. Uh, so uh, to me, that's uh, some of the keys that we have to focus on. You know, it's amazing that um, they will put the, and, and nothing about the immigrants, but not take care of our veterans first. Yeah, I want to stop you right there. You said immigrants. I fully support immigrants. We want to do everything we can to help and support immigrants. Illegal immigrants. Illegal immigrants That's is a key. different. And I apologize for that. Different Illegal immigrants. Group, yep. Um, what would you do? How would you change this? Well, I would, I would put the dollars that they're talking about funding to help our veterans first. Where does that start at? What do you mean, where does it start? Where does, uh, how do you get that, mo how would you get that moving before the Ill Illegal Immigrant Act? I mean, Congress has to allocate money. They allocate dollars for specific programs. She's proposed allocating those dollars first for now. the program now for illegal immigrants. I'm saying take those same dollars and Put allocate them, them first veterans. to veterans. Once you got the system up and working for veterans, Fine, then, then let's look at other groups. Like well, that. we have what they, what they call the choice for our veterans, where they can go outside yes. the VA. Yep. Um, I think that I, was a good step. I do, too. I think it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense because they're not receiving the care that they should be getting at the VA. They're overcrowded. They're waiting weeks and months for appointments, and this now allows them the opportunity 
to reach past that and find the help that they need. As, as I've said, Medicare for all means something similar to what the VA has been, which is not the best medical opportunities for people. No, we have veterans that are waiting literally months yes. for appointments. Months. And by the way, uh, if you happen to be a Canadian citizen and you have the Canadian health care plan, you will wait months right. for, for uh, many types of medical care. In, in, in some cases, people die, so they never have to provide it. Uh, in other cases, uh, people, uh, if you're a Canadian citizen and you are both wealthy and healthy, right. it's a great program because it doesn't cost as much as it might otherwise. But if you get sick and you're wealthy, at least you can go to the United States and get those services. Right. But if you're poor and you're sick, it's not so good. Elected the Congress what would your priority be? Uh, we talked about this a yeah. little earlier. Right, those are the three things that I think I would focus on. The economy uh, and tax policy is one. Uh, improving the medical care, working together with the other side, with the Democrats, to try to get... Would a, you be par bipartisan if there was an issue that you really believed in? Absolutely, and no question Even about it. Even if it wasn't a Republican issue, it was a... Would look at my cross record. Over that aisle? Look at my record in Springfield. I, and I have on countless occasions stood up on the Senate floor and said, "Guys, please, if it's a good bill, vote yes. You if know, it's a bad bill, uh, vote no. Regardless of which." So you're not going to vote just on political lines. I am not. Thank God. That's what we need right now. We need some. We need someone like you on the Supreme Court. Yes. <laughs> 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 yes, we do. Um, it's a. It's. It's great to have you here tonight. Um, I want to thank you. I know you just came in from a, a long... <laughs> I got the experience of a red-eye. <laughs> Mike, thank you for having me. It's, no, it's an it's, honor it's, and a pleasure to be with you. It's our pleasure to have you here, and the best of luck. And I truly believe in what you're, what you're running for, and um, I, I just keep us posted. Thank you. Keep up your good work here, too. Thank All you, right. sir. Pleasure. Thank you.